Queenslander, then sing along with me. So join in the chorus and sing it one and all. We join are the bears the on the road to victory. The Brisbane Lions, in my humble, unbiased opinion, are one of the greatest football clubs of the AFL era. And I don't just say this because of their silverware. I say this because of how the Brisbane Lions' entire existence has been defined by them overcoming adversity, winning three away grand finals in a row, and almost winning a fourth, had they been able to score 41 more points. Coming back from the dead after almost a decade of mediocrity and Fitzroy-like hopelessness to become a premiership contending and also sometimes choking beast. And how the Brisbane Lions went from an unwanted one-night stand baby to a successful club in just a couple of years. But when I think about Queensland footy overcoming adversity, I think about a football club that had to scratch and claw just to get a license. I think about a football club that had to play their home games over an hour away from their home city in, to be blunt, a shithole who had drafted players straight up refuse to come play for them, who were inexplicably linked to one of Australia's most notorious criminals, whose mascot wasn't even a f***ing bear, it's a goddamn marsupial. When I think about underdog stories in our great game, I think about a small, subtropical city and the Brisbane Bears. Let's go back to the beginning of the AFL in its modern state. The chain of events which got us to where we are today can be traced back to November 1976 when the state level Victorian Football League defected from the National Football League. No, not that one. No, this NFL was the national governing body for football at the time. The VFL were able to secure a lucrative TV rights deal for their own night series, which they were able to establish breaking away from the opposing NFL night series, which included the SANFL and the WAFL. This little defection would give the VFL significant financial and political power and would be the first step in the VFL becoming the AFL several years later. One of the main reasons the other state level competitions weren't able to step up and do what the VFL did was actually quite simple. They had a larger population for starters, which meant that there was higher demand for Victorian footy, which meant the VFL was in a position to gain a better TV rights deal, and the VFL were able to lure in not only players from other states, but also their supporters. By the start of the 80s, the VFL was starting to gain momentum, the Victorian clubs had more cash to throw around, and were able to get the best players throughout the country to play for them. And the little Victorians that could had aspirations of becoming a professional national league. But it turns out that this, combined with the practice of luring away massively talented players with big contracts, is pretty expensive. And a lot of the Victorian clubs weren't prepared for this. This sent them into crippling financial debt and hardship. In a way, this rapid expansion nearly killed the VFL altogether. Commissioner for Corporate Affairs, Gordon Lewis, penned a letter to the VFL commissioners outlining how dire the financial situation was for the league, and I quote, Of the 11 Victorian club companies, it appears that seven of them are technically insolvent. These clubs are Fitzroy, Geelong, Footscray, Collingwood, Melbourne, North Melbourne, and Richmond. During the course of that discussion, it was represented to me that Fitzroy, North Melbourne, St. Kilda, and Melbourne clubs would seek to merge with either one another or some other club companies. Please advise me within seven days what steps the Victorian and football league or its club company members propose to take to remedy the situation unless your response to me contains some viable proposals to remedy the present situation it is my intention to carry out my statutory obligations the league needed cash and it needed it now but when their backs were against the wall the VFL decided no, no, dig up, stupid. they were going to do what they did to get themselves into this mess, but better. They aggressively expanded interstate 
as they believed this would be the answer to their prayers. More eyes on the VFL from other states meant more demand, which meant that they could once again argue for a higher TV rights deal. Focusing. Which meant that, combined with the comically large licensing fees they were going to charge the new clubs, they'd be able to pull themselves out of this mess and come out on top. And so, in 1987, the VFL decided their saviors would be Western Australia and Queensland. For Western Australia, a traditionally AFL-oriented state, assembling a full national-level competition completely out of their arse was no issue. Their issues came from the other VFL clubs, citing costs of travelling to Perth and losing several WA players looking to return home. However, for Queensland, it was the opposite. Getting a football team approved was no issue. Their issues would be internal. Despite being a predominantly rugby-oriented state, Aussie Rules Football was doing quite well for themselves. They had an established state competition in the QAFL, and with migration from southern states such as Victoria, the game was only growing to strange new places. Actor Paul Cronin knew this, and was one of the first to approach the VFL in 1984, with the intention of purchasing a license for a Brisbane-based team. However, the QAFL felt that it would be a better idea for a Victorian club to relocate to Brisbane instead of creating a completely new team from scratch. And as these two parties were squabbling over who was right, out of nowhere came Brisbane promoter John Brown. No, not that one. In 1985, with his own bid. Now here's something I find very fascinating. I mentioned earlier that the QAFL were proposing that a Victorian club move up to Queensland, as the precedent had already been set with the Sydney Swans moving a couple years earlier. And one of the football clubs that was being seriously considered for a relocation was the Fitzroy Lions. That's right, there were serious plans for the Lions to relocate in 1986, 10 years before they were dragged kicking and screaming up north to merge with the Bears. I like to think that my beloved Brisbane Lions were destined to happen, one way or another. Anyway, despite other campaigns gaining momentum, Paul Cronin was hell-bent and wouldn't take no for an answer. He personally approached every VFL president to garner their support, and the final thing that got the Cronin bid over the line was the support of the millionaire entrepreneur and Quintex owner, Christopher Scase. Scammings! It's a good job, mate. I don't want to go too far off topic, but Scase and his antics are pivotal to the band's history. Christopher Scase, at 28 years old, had worked his way up from a stockbroker and finance journalist to purchasing an, at the time, small financial services company, Quintex. From 1975 onwards, he would build Quintex into a billion dollar empire by the late 1980s, before he had even turned 40. As he began to establish himself as a titan in the international business world, he began to network with some powerful people in the US. When looking at the rapid growth of his empire and his personal profile, you could argue that he was trying to speedrun becoming Australia's version of Donald Trump. Here's what the AFL CEO at the time, Ross Oakley, had to say. Christopher Scase uh, was a most interesting character. He had no interest in football at all. He had interest in Christopher Scase and developing and building his profile. I think he decided to get involved because when he went to America to talk to the billionaires that he wanted to do business with, he needed to be able to say, well, I've got a football team too. So unlike Paul Cronin, where the Brisbane football team was his passion project, Scase was only interested in putting his fingerprints on as many ventures and public entities as possible, as a way to flex on all his billionaire mates. Regardless of motive, Scase's involvement did help get the club going when they needed cash, and the AFL weren't allowed to step in or face the wrath of the other club presidents. And so, the new football team was introduced as the Brisbane Bears. Their branding included a koala bear mascot, which isn't even an actual bear. And we believe it is far preferable to have a bear of Australian flavour, marsupial as it may be, rather than a bear of overseas domicile. But it wasn't all doom and gloom. This new football club gave us perhaps the greatest club theme song in VFL AFL history. Yo, yo, yo. Ah! 
Now apparently it became clear that not only did Skase not care about footy, he didn't even care about the VFL higher-ups, based on how Ross Oakley was treated at the Bears' first home game at Carrara. The first day, big gathering at the, at the ground, big dinner, and, and the, the normal protocol was for the chairman of the AFL to sit with the current president and a few sponsors. Well, I was right in the back corner of the room sitting with people I, I had no idea who they were. You're a fucking flog. Regardless of these antics, his contribution was critical for the Bears' survival. Now it should go without saying, but the Bears were far from a thriving organisation, both in terms of profits and on-field performance. And despite the backing of Christopher Skase, the club still amassed a debt of $28 million. But as long as millionaire Christopher Skase is around, the club has nothing to worry about. Now, meanwhile, Skase was still developing his empire at a rapid rate, ignoring warnings of overextending and biting off more than he could chew. This would all come to a head after a failed purchase of MGM Studios, compounded by rising interest rates. Skase's house of cards began to crumble. As his empire was collapsing, he began moving money into foreign bank accounts and he was forced to sell off his resorts. His company collapsed and he was formally charged with improperly using his position to obtain management fees, whatever the hell that means. He spent one night in jail before some absolute f***ing vegetable of a judge not only allowed him to be released with bail, but also gave him back his f***ing passport. Yeah. <laughs> and then, in a plot twist that a blindfolded, dead for 10 years Stevie Wonder could see coming, Skase fled the country to Spain where he remained until his death from cancer in 2001. What a baby. Now when Skase fled the country, the future of the Brisbane Bears was suddenly put in jeopardy. They had no owner, no contracts. The club could have very well have folded right then and there. The team actually didn't play in the pre AFL pre-season competition that year. The team didn't have an owner for a period of time, and so the players actually didn't have contracts and were afraid to play given they might be injured and weren't certain what the future was. Reuben Pellerman then agreed to become the owner of the, uh, of the Bears. Like I said earlier, as the Bears began to unravel off the field, on the field, things weren't much better. They did get off to a good start setting the Premiership race on fire with a remarkable two-game winning streak. However, things would immediately go downhill, only missing out on the wooden spoon by one game. 1988 wasn't much better, only missing the wooden spoon thanks to St Kilda. Thanks to some aggressive recruiting practices, including signing Warwick Kappa, they started to show signs of life. However, it wasn't enough to save inaugural coach Peter Knights, who was sacked after the Bears suffered their second blowout loss to the Geelong Cats. Things began to look up for the mighty Brisbane marsupials. After winning the wooden spoon in 1990, the Bears would rally together in 1991 and go on to win the prestigious VFL Premiership. Sorry, I should clarify, it was the VFL Reserves Premiership. But they were still the first interstate club to win a Premiership in the VFL at any level. Unfortunately, this success didn't carry over into the real season, as they would once again get the wooden spoon. In 1992, the club arguably hit its lowest point, with the Round 7 molestation of the Bears at the hands of the Geelong Cats, and to this day it's still the highest score in VFL-AFL history. But, thanks to the incomparable Melbourne D's, it's not remembered as much, thanks to the advent of recency bias, and I've just gone and reminded everybody of my pre-merged club's second most humiliating moment. Lovely. Things were only getting worse for Brisbane, because players they picked up in the recently introduced draft would straight up refuse to come and play for them. We would recruit players and they didn't want to come. Uh, they just felt that the place had no future. And I can remember having quite a few arguments with uh, players and their managers. And sometimes we just dug deep and, and insisted that players that we drafted would come. We were just going to let players who we drafted just drift away 
while we had no credibility at all. And eventually we made it a place uh, where people wanted to come. Despite their rough start, the Bears' fortunes would start to turn. They were able to relocate to the Gower as the state government agreed to remove the dog racing track and redevelop the stands into a proper football stadium rather than a third world country. They got snazzy new uniforms, but most importantly, they got a shiny new toy in Nathan Buckley. Even though it was flat out obvious that he was going to jump ship at the end of the season, he still played his heart out and so did the rest of the team. Ruben Pellerman stepped down as owner and the Bears reverted to the membership owned structure that all the clubs have today. And it's a good thing they moved to the Gabba when they did because when the Bears actually started playing in Brisbane, the membership and the crowd attendance would instantly triple in numbers. One of the highlights of the year came in this bittersweet moment in round eight. One year after their record breaking thumping at the hands of Geelong, the bad news Bears would absolutely discombobulate Ron Barassi's Sydney ones at the Gabatoire by 162 points. In fact, their free quarter time score of 27-17-179 was the highest free quarter time score in VFL AFL history until the record was beaten in 2007. What's even more ridiculous about this game is that this drubbing came at the hands of a team with four wins to their name that year, but the on-field performance really started to ramp up in 94. They won five more games and they came very close to a maiden finals berth had they not come undone in the back end of the season. They also debuted a brand new logo and a new club song which, unfortunately, has been lost to the annals of time. The only remnants we have are the song playing in the background of this footy match. 11-11, Justin Leppage kicked three goals in that final term. Marcus Ashcroft got their other one. North Melbourne, 8-11. And also this. If you are a Queenslander, then sing along with me. We are the Bears on the road to victory. In 1995, we got our first taste of the brand new Bears as they would storm into the finals for the first time in their history after a big second half of the year. They did get knocked out in the first round of the finals, but the stage was set for the culmination of almost a decade of pain, instability, hopelessness, and despair. Oh well, now back to my life. <laughs> Nobody knew it at the time, but 1996, would be a Brisbane Bears coming out party. Four years removed from their 1992 Geelong demolition, they would come from absolutely nowhere and rocket to third on the ladder behind North Melbourne and fellow struggling interstate club, Sydney. This would be the year that vindicated the VFL's push to expand into New South Wales and Queensland. The Bears were flying, and if the Bears playing group were able to stay healthy and united, then they'd be lifting their first Premiership Cup faster than you can say Fitzroy Lions going into administration. Of course, uh, the Nauruan government, the Nauruan Insurance Corporation, decided during the week that they would no longer uh, put their money in with the Fitzroy Football Club. That's come to a head. Just how serious that situation is was summed up by Michael Brennan this afternoon. There is no money in the bank. Uh, there are no realisable assets on hand. Whilst all this was happening, Almost a decade of financial turmoil would reach its boiling point, and after an ill-fated loan with the government of Nauru, the Lions were placed into administration. The club was given two options, merger or death. Now there had been several attempts at merging other clubs with Fitzroy, and even a few relocation attempts. Not only did Fitzroy attempt a Brisbane relocation in 1986, but the Brisbane Bears had attempted to take over the crippled club in 1990, only to be rejected by the Fitzroy board. This time, however, there was nowhere for the Lions to go. Backed into a corner by the AFL, who were refusing to bail out the club, Fitzroy had no choice but to merge with another club and compromise 113 years of history. If I may, what happened to Fitzroy was absolutely disgusting. Yeah, Fitzroy had themselves in a bit of a hole, but the whole point of bringing in new clubs was to prop up the struggling teams. I think it's disgraceful that the AFL let a club get to the state. A foundation club, no less. If an expansion club like the Eagles or the Bears fell off a cliff due to financial troubles, then so be it. But to let a foundation club 
that's been there since the start of your competition, one of the richest histories in the league, a club that could have gone on to be a massive Victorian club like Richmond or Carlton, reduced to nothing. What happened to Fitzroy makes me sick. I love my Brisbane Lions, but I would have happily supported the Brisbane Bears, or the Brisbane Ibises, or the Brisbane Valley Rats, or whatever the fuck. The death of Fitzroy was preventable, and it should have never have been allowed to happen. Back on subject, several clubs were floated as merger candidates, and the front runner became North Melbourne, and it seemed like it was all but a done deal. However, concerns began to rise about the prospect of a super team, a club powerful enough to eclipse the rest of the competition. As the North Fitzroy merger began to lose support, up North, the head honchos of the Brisbane Bears saw the commotion and made a decision that would change the AFL as they knew it forever. Despite on-field performances improving, the Bears' future was still uncertain. They were still struggling financially. They had little to no support in Melbourne. They were still playing in a rugby league stronghold with no guarantee that they would be able to break into the market. They were also sick and tired of their mascot not even being a bear. And the Bears had a choice. They could try to go about it on their own with no guarantee that the Bears experiment would be a success. Or they can throw Fitzroy a lifeline, adopt their heritage, legacy and identity and sacrifice the Bears' short, troubled history so one of the oldest sporting clubs not only in Australia but the entire world could continue in some capacity. Eventually, Brisbane decided that they would no longer dare to beat the Bear. And so they marched down to Melbourne and came on all the other Victorian clubs like some sort of book curator with their offer of $1 million more than North and taking only 8 players from the Fitzroy list. Their power play succeeded, and at the end of the 1996 season, the Brisbane Bears and the Fitzroy Lions would cease to exist. The club celebrated this veritable murder of Fitzroy, and the Brisbane Lions would take to the field in 1997. But the thing is, the Bears and the Lions still had games to play in the 96 season, including a game between the Bears and the Lions later that year. Unfortunately, the supporters of the Fitzroy Lions were subject to watching their beloved club get thrashed week in, week out, only recording one win in their final year. The AFL and Brisbane Bears chairman Noel Gordon, not thinking that killing their club was enough, felt it prudent to send a drunken Noel Gordon onto the footy show and deliver this message to the Fitzroy supporters. We started, as I said, four years ago with $375,000 in the bank and we'll make a profit of $100,000 in four years. It's taken Fitzroy 120, 113 years to lose $4 million. So, I mean, draw your own conclusion, I don't know. All right, no, well, them's fighting words, and uh, I don't know how many of the Fitzroy Very boys much. would be too happy to hear that. But uh, at the end of the day, that is the deal that has been done. The Fitzroy Lions limped into the end of the season, suffered one more kick in the balls with their last game being stuck in fucking Fremantle, and the Fitzroy Lions were no more. However, the Bears still had a finals campaign to play through. In their first top four final, the Bears faced perhaps one of the great football clubs, coached by one of the greatest coaches, with one of the greatest players who would go on to share the Brownlow with Brisbane's own Michael Voss. If the Brisbane Bears, who had been the laughing stock of the competition since their inception, wanted to achieve their first finals win in their club's history, they would have to do it the hard way. This Bombers team, fresh off their historic 1993 flag and four years away from their near-perfect season were no longer the Baby Bombers. They had gone from being a baby to like a 14-year-old boy who's probably been brainwashed from watching too many Andrew Tate videos or something. And the Bears, who have had to overcome adversity just to even exist, who had to overcome adversity to survive, would have to overcome adversity one more time to thrive. What happened next was nothing short of remarkable.
Scott has kicked the first goal of the final. Lynch in his 150th game, his first final tonight, at 28 years of age, kicks the goal. Scott's kicked towards full forward. Out in front is Lynch, you'll get another one. Lynch, two goals in a minute. Should go. He's got it. May take his man on a third at 54 metres. Goes for goal and kicks it. They're in front. Now Lepic, the crummer. He's got the ball. He's outside 50. Can he give the hand pass? Oh, reminiscent of a game here a couple of weeks ago. Straight in goes Justin Lepic. And he gets the lead back for Brisbane. Lepic kicks for goal and puts it through. Two goals in three minutes to Justin Lepic. The mighty Essington Bombers had dared to beat the Bear and they left the Gabba with their heads dropped in shame. The next week was even more insane. They faced last year's Premier's Carlton in a semi-final, and these f***ing bears obliterated them by 97 points. The next week, one of the most ridiculous and entertaining finals campaigns in recent memory would come to an end at the hands of the Kanga 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 Roo Roo Roos in the prelim final. Nine years ago, the Brisbane Bears played their first game against North at the MCG. It seemed only fitting that their last home game would be played against North at the MCG. When I grow up, I want to stick my head through a circle at the beginning of movies and roar. <laughs> What's up now, bitches? I'm going to go through the rest of the Lions history to date just because of what became of a lot of the Bears roster from the 96 season. The first year of the Brisbane Lions had highs and lows. They lost to eventual Premier's Adelaide in their first game before obliterating that year's runner-up, St Kilda, by 97 points. They scraped into the finals, coming in 8th from percentage in front of the power. They lost their first final as the Brisbane Lions against the Saints by 46 points, a stark contrast to their Round 2 clash. 1998 was a pretty disastrous year. The momentum that the Bears carried into the merger was overshadowed by the off-field turmoil from the actual merge itself, and an injury-riddled Lions would finish with the wooden spoon. As a result, John Norvey was sacked as coach, two years after taking the Bears to a prelim final. The club needed a strong leader to steer the Brisbane Lions ship and establish a sense of order and unity. And so, they hired VFL-AFL Player of the Century, Hawthorne Premiership player, and Collingwood Premiership coach, Lee Matthews. Imposing figure, symbol of conquest. Their unending hunger has left only chaos and ruin in their wake. Truly, this beast is loaded with swag. Their fortunes would change almost immediately. They had a talented list and they immediately rose from 16th to 3rd. They made it to the 1999 prelim final, where they were once again beaten by North Melbourne. You can't keep getting away with it! In 2000, they had another good year. They dipped a little bit, finishing 6th, and then they got demolished by the Blues in the semi-final. At the start of the 2001 season, after a big off-season recruitment-wise, without any certainty of if this group was going to be able to take the next step, the Lions would make an incredible run to the grand final. Jump started by their game against Essendon and Lee Matthews' radio interview, featuring both his very unfortunate pronunciation of Arnie's last name. Who's favourites? The great Arnold Schwarzenegger for a little bit of assistance. Almost. Predator movie that Arnie Schwarzenegger <laughs> in and, there and the now iconic quote, if it bleeds, we can kill it. And that year's grand final, you could argue, was a day of healing and vindication for long-suffering Roy's fans and Bears fans who had to watch their club be scrubbed from existence and history. And we all know what happened after that. They won three in a row, lost a chance at four in a row, fell into obscurity for a couple of years, showed signs of life in 2009, fell off a cliff into the depths of footy hell before another Hawthorne figurehead would come to rescue them. And now, 27 years after the Bears ceased to exist, we find ourselves with another talented Lions outfit who, after a big off-season recruitment-wise, may or may not take the next step. Only time will tell. United, we will conquer. Divided, we will fall. But the spirit of the North will see us conquer over all. For we have but one ambition, that's to cut those southerners down so the mighty bears from Brisbane can bring the cup to town. And that's a promise. Come on, the bears. <laughs>